Hey everyone, welcome to Sludging for the Win. I'm Dave, and this is my daily treatment. Today, I'm covering a topic a lot of you have been hoping for for a long time, a detailed deep dive into the activated sludge process. Developed by British researchers just prior to World War I, today, the activated sludge process forms the backbone of most municipal secondary plants operating worldwide. The fundamental operating principle is that many of the most common pollutants that we want to remove from wastewater can be eaten by microbes. The activated in activated sludge refers to the colonies of active microbes growing in the sludge, which are referred to as bugs in colloquial wastewater parlance. If we give those bugs a suitable environment to reproduce, they'll happily feed on those pollutants, breaking them down and converting them into more microbes. Then we can separate the heavier microbes from the wastewater using a normal sedimentation and flocculation process that I'm sure you're all familiar with. But I don't want to get too far ahead of myself here. Let's start from the very beginning and go through all the steps in detail. So here's a crude schematic diagram of a typical wastewater treatment process that uses the activated sludge. As I said before, this is a secondary treatment operation, meaning that some degree of primary treatment is necessary to remove gross debris, grit, and some of the easier to remove pollutants before the waste stream hits the activated sludge tank. Additionally, if this is a municipal setting, there's probably a permitting program that requires significant industrial users to do some sort of pretreatment on any wastewater that leaves their facility. This part of the diagram here is where the activated sludge process is actually happening. The physical requirements are pretty simple. You need a tank to contain all the wastewater and microbes. The industry term for the contents of this tank is mixed liquor, although this definitely is not the kind of liquor you would want to drink. Now, it turns out the microbes that do the best job of breaking down the pollutants in the water are bacteria operating under aerobic conditions. In other words, using oxygen to live and grow. So this tank needs to have some way of adding oxygen to the mixed liquor to support these bacteria. And this makes sense when you think about it. One of the principal goals of this treatment is to reduce the BOD, or biochemical oxygen demand, of the water. So it makes sense that reducing this demand would involve supplying additional oxygen to the microbes during the treatment. We'll talk more about BOD when it's time to discuss the operating parameters. There are a couple of different ways that are used to introduce this oxygen. Sometimes mechanical aerators consisting of a motor that drives paddles or blades to froth up the surface of the mixed liquor are used. Otherwise, the plant will install bubble diffusers on the bottom of the tank and blow pressurized air through them. After the aeration tank, the mixed liquor is pumped to another tank called the clarifier. There's no air or mixing in this tank because its purpose is to separate the activated sludge out of the water. And the way that's done is to do, well, nothing. If you have the right bacteria active in your sludge, they will glom together into macroscopic clumps called flocks in a process called flocculation. These flocks are heavy enough to sink down to the bottom of the tank if the water is still, leaving a clear layer on top, from which the clarifier gets its name. The clear water gets pumped out and onto the next phase of treatment, usually some form of disinfection before it gets discharged to the receiving waters. The sludge handling is a little bit more interesting though. Some of the activated sludge is removed from the clarifier, stabilized, and then disposed of off-site. There are several possibilities for its ultimate destination, with direct application to farmland as fertilizer, incineration, and landfilling being the most common. Because this sludge is discarded as a waste product rather than used in the process, it's called waste activated sludge, or WAS, and the process of pumping it away is called wasting. The rest of the sludge is recycled back into the aeration tank. The reason for this is that not all microbes work the same. Good, efficient functioning of the activated sludge process relies on maintaining a population of bugs that work together to break down the normal pollution load on the plant. Too many harmful bugs, or an imbalance in the type of bugs present, will cause operational problems, as will too many or too few bugs compared to the amount of food present. The way to address this is to return some of the activated sludge from the clarifier back into the aeration tank, which seeds that tank with the population of microbes that we want to see. If you've ever brewed beer, this should sound pretty familiar to you. You could just leave the wort out and hope that the wild yeasts that exist everywhere in the environment will ferment it into beer the way the first brewers did, but that would be a terrible idea. Different yeasts break down the same food into different products, and there's no guarantee that the wild yeast that gains a foothold in your pot will end up producing something palatable, or even safe for consumption. So you add a starter dose of brewer's yeast to the wort in order to make sure the dominant population of microbes that develop will be the type that can ferment it into something you would want to drink. 
In the same way, the wastewater plant seeds the mixed liquor with return activated sludge to give the good bugs a head start so that they can outcompete the harmful ones. We'll talk a lot more about what specific types of bugs you do and don't want to see in an activated sludge system, but before that I think it would be a good idea to review exactly what you want to see from a running activated sludge plant in general. How can you tell whether a wastewater plant is running well or poorly? There are a few parameters that the operators will be keeping a close eye on in order to achieve the desired treatment goals. The first is one that I already mentioned, BOD, biochemical oxygen demand, is the principal pollutant that the activated sludge process is designed to remove, so it's a good place to start. Well, I say pollutant, but that's not really quite right. See, BOD isn't a specific element or compound. When you say that there's lead or cyanide in the water, those are specific chemicals. But BOD is the name analysts give to the results of a test to see how much dissolved oxygen in a sample of wastewater gets used up under a controlled set of conditions for a specific period of time. Even here in the land of freedom units, BOD is customarily reported in milligrams of oxygen consumed per liter of water. For those who aren't involved in wastewater treatment, it might seem kind of strange that we would care about this. I mean, obviously if there's lead or cyanide or some other toxic substance in the water, that's bad. But it isn't quite as obvious why it would be bad to have too much oxygen demand. Well, there's two problems. First, high oxygen demand means that more of the dissolved oxygen will be removed from the water. If you imagine what happens to humans when there isn't enough oxygen available, you could see why that would be a concern for an aquatic ecosystem that the wastewater might get discharged into. The other reason is that BOD is an easy to measure surrogate for the amount of microbes and organic pollutants present in a sample. Rather than trying to test for all of them individually, it's much easier to test for BOD and use that number to tell how well you're doing. Next, let's talk about the other major pollutant parameter, suspended solids. Now, I suppose that unlike BOD, it's pretty obvious why this one would be considered a pollutant. So let's talk a little bit more about how it's measured and what it means. Like BOD, the suspended solids in the mixed liquor, creatively referred to as the mixed liquor suspended solids, are measured in milligrams per liter of water. Now, it's important to take this sample in the aeration tank rather than in the clarifier. The thing that distinguishes suspended solids from dissolved solids is the fact that they will settle out of the water if it's too still, leading to inaccurate or inconsistent readings. The whole point of the clarifier is that it's going to be a place where the water is relatively still so that the solids can settle out. Now, the amount of suspended solids in the aeration tank is usually substantially higher than the amount that's in the water that's going into the aeration tank. Can you guess why? It's because the bugs that are growing in the aeration tank are themselves suspended solids. The activated sludge process works because those bugs grow and turn into flocks that are easier to settle out than the stuff that we started with. As a process control parameter, the amount of bugs that we have in the aeration tank is very important. But how do we distinguish between the suspended solids that are bugs and the suspended solids that we started with? In practice, the way that we do this is by burning. The bugs can be burned up if they are suspended solids that are placed in a furnace, but the other suspended solids generally can't be. Of course, this method isn't perfect for telling the difference between the two, but it's relatively easy to do in a laboratory setting and it's close enough to use for process control. The amount of suspended solids that are able to be burned away is referred to as the mixed liquor volatile suspended solids. Now, by itself, the amount of bugs in the mixed liquor isn't super useful as a control parameter because the desired size of your population of microbes depends on how much BOD you need them to remove. To get the whole story then, these two parameters are often combined into a ratio, the FM ratio. That stands for food to microbes or some sources say food to mass, as in the mass of bugs ready to eat that food. Activated sludge plants have a goal FM ratio that they try to operate at and control plans for what to do if they get too far away from that optimum value. Too much deviation can lead to the microbe population falling out of balance and becoming overrun with undesirable bugs, since different species thrive under different conditions. This ratio will also vary from plant to plant based on the nature of BOD sources that hit the wastewater. Another parameter that's also important for trying to measure the population of bugs in the aeration tank, the mean cell retention time, is the average number of days that any specific bug or cell is expected to stay in the tank. This is calculated by taking the weight of the suspended solids in the aeration tank and the clarifier and dividing by the weight of the suspended solids removed from the system every day. I've heard that different plants also take their TSS readings at different parts of the process, which makes it hard to compare MCRT times directly unless you know how they were calculated. 
For example, some plants use sludge age or solids retention time, which are calculated similarly in their process control plans. Since the ultimate goal of the activated sludge process is to settle the solids out of the wastewater, it also makes sense that another process control parameter is intended to measure how easily the sludge settles out. To measure the sludge volume index, we take a sample of mixed liquor and we let it stand for a set amount of time, usually 30 minutes. Then compare the fraction of the volume that the sludge takes up after settling with the mixed liquor suspended solids to get a feel for what kind of settling you should expect. Low SVIs generally mean good settling, whereas higher SVIs are associated with poorer settling. There are other process control parameters that I could talk about too, but I think those are the ones that are the most important to understanding how an activated sludge plant functions. If you're interested in learning more about them or about the laboratory tests that technicians do to determine their values, that might be a good idea for a future patron pick episode. But I think right now would be a good time to talk about the actual bugs themselves. What kind of microbes are actually present in the aeration tank? The active ingredient in activated sludge is bacteria. Now, microbiologists have all kinds of ways to classify bacteria, but for us in wastewater treatment, there are two important types. Bacteria reproduce by division. The single-celled organisms literally divide in two. You can kind of think that this might be like if you had a bunch of grains of something, like maybe rice, and each of those grains was a bacterium that could split in two and grow into two full-size grains. The grains can all kind of stick together, but the overall bulk shape is an amorphous blob, with the grains free to move around relative to each other. The other major way that bacteria can grow is that some bacteria stay connected after the division happens, which causes them to grow into filaments. You can imagine this might be like a train, where each car is capable of dividing in two, but when they do, they grow into two full-size cars that are still connected to the same cars in the front and in the back. Now, the reason that we care about this distinction in wastewater treatment is because it affects the flock formation. Remember, the reason that we want to grow these bacteria in the first place is that when the bacteria convert pollutants into more bacteria, they clump up together and become easier to settle out to the bottom of a clarifier. In order to get good flock, you need a little bit of those filamentous bacteria for all the other ones to stick to. But if you have too much, the surface area increases faster than the weight, which means the flock doesn't settle out as easily in the clarifier. You can kind of think of the filamentous bacteria as a net that the other bacteria can stick to. If you have too much net, there won't be enough weight sticking to it for it to sink very well. And if you don't have enough net, then the bacteria won't stick together at all because there's no structure. So you need a minimum amount of net with a sufficient amount of weight to cause it to sink quickly. Now, bacteria form about 90% plus of the organisms in the mixed liquor, but they aren't the only ones there. Protozoa also play an important part of the activated sludge. Especially for wastewater treatment, the types of protozoa present can indicate how well the sludge will settle and what types of problems you might have. So there are a few basic body shapes the protozoa can have. We have blob looking ones like this that move slowly through the water, and those are called amoebas. Then we have flagellates, which move around by whipping the little tail looking part to propel themselves. Then we have ciliates, which have a bunch of these little hair like protrusions. So they're kind of uh, two different types of ciliates. There's free swimming ciliates, which move through the water with coordinated motion of their cilia, kind of like if you were to imagine how a centipede might swim. And then there are these stalked ciliates, which attach to some larger mass and use their uh, cilia to grab and ensnare food that passes by. And the last two classes of organisms that I'll describe are rotifers and nematodes. Now, these are multicellular organisms, which means that it takes longer for colonies of them to get established in the sludge, and they eat large numbers of bacteria for each individual. Here's a diagram produced by the EPA that shows the relative population sizes of these protozoa compared to how old the sludge is. And you can see that the higher organisms are associated with a higher mean cell residence time, in other words, a longer time spent in the aeration tank before being wasted or pumped out. And these species also cause a lower sludge volume index, which means better settling of sludge. And if you think about it, that makes sense. Multicellular organisms spend their time eating large amounts of bacteria. And the way to make good flock is to get a bunch of small, light particles to agglomerate together into heavier, larger particles. And that's pretty much what that equates to. On the other hand, you can see that a longer mean cell residence time is also associated with a lower FM ratio, and that makes sense too. Remember that F is the food that we want the microbes to eat, and the M is the weight of the microbes. 
if we have more higher order microbes, then the same food is able to feed more microbes because the higher order microbes aren't eating the original pollutants, they're eating the bacteria that are feeding on the pollutants. Unfortunately, as you can see, low SVI, which equates to good settling of sludge, is directly opposed to low MCRT and high FM, which are equating to efficient and quick treatment. So we have to strike a balance for where we go for the most efficient treatment possible while still getting the sludge to settle adequately. And the balance has to be struck at each individual plant. There isn't just one best spot for plants in general to operate at. Some of that boils down to the fact that different plants have different loading rates, in other words, different amounts of BOD and TSS that they need to remove, and the types of industrial activity in the area can also drive these figures. For example, metals processing plants introduce a lot of TSS but hardly any BOD, whereas other industries like meat packing have very different waste profiles. There are also other types of variables that come from like the local climate, how much space is available, the cost of different types of treatment equipment. All of this means that there are lots of ways engineers and city planners have modified the conventional activated sludge process to promote each individual plant's specific goals. The first and most obvious thing that might be modified is the loading rate. A conventional activated sludge plant might have a sludge age of 5 to 15 days, but a high rate plant might run at 1 to 3 days, whereas a low rate plant might be in the range of 20 to 30 days. You can see that a higher rate plant can produce a load many times higher than a conventional or low rate one. Uh, if it's possible to process so much more, why do you think that plants would run slower? Well, if you remembered the discussion from the previous section, you might have said that the sludge wouldn't settle as well in a plant that had a higher loading rate. And that's a great answer. High rate ASPs are often pre-treatment plants that industrial users run to get their wastewater ready to discharge to the sewer. If these plants only need to eliminate 50 to 60% of their BOD, that might be sufficient to get their wastewater into compliance with the terms of their permit. In other words, into a range that a larger municipal treatment plant downstream of them could handle. So there's no problem with a lower efficiency. Another reason for higher low rate ASPs is that some industries have variable loads throughout the year. Imagine a fruit canning factory, for example. When the fruit is in season, the factory will have a lot of higher output and therefore a lot more BOD in their wastewater than when the fruit is out of season. Such a factory may have an ASP that runs at a low rate for part of the year and a conventional rate for the rest of the year. Another design decision has to do with the nature of the aeration tank. A complete mix activated sludge process uses a circular or square aeration tank that is mixed throughout so that the temperature, dissolved oxygen, suspended solids, and so on are relatively constant at each point in the tank. I imagine this is probably what most of you thought about when you originally heard of an aeration tank. So what's the alternative? A plug flow ASP uses a long narrow aeration channel that introduces inflow at one end and pumps out at the other end. Imagine a boat floating down a canal. The boat moves along with the water and there might be a little local mixing specifically near the aerators but for the most part the water that's close to the boat at the beginning of the canal stays near it throughout its entire journey all the way to the end. Contrast that with a complete mix tank where the goal is that all of the water is completely getting mixed up constantly. A complete mix tank does a better job at handling toxic loads that might kill off the bugs since they'll be distributed over a larger volume. On the other hand, a plug flow design is capable of greater pollutant removal for the same volume of a uh, tank. Another modification that you sometimes see is something called step feed. This is where wastewater is introduced to the aeration tank at multiple spots. Obviously, this really only makes sense if you're using a plug flow design since in a complete mix, everything is getting all mixed together anyway. But this can help capture some of the benefits of that type of process while still running as a more efficient plug flow. For example, you can distribute a toxic load throughout the aeration tank to dilute its impact, or you can introduce your influent later on into the flow if you need to, which can help with sludge settling problems. This same principle can be applied to the air supply in the aeration tank too. A tapered aeration design introduces more air at the beginning of a plug flow aeration tank and tapers off the supply along the length of the tank. This is usually done with increasing energy efficiency by introducing less air in the spots where it would be used the least. Let's say you don't have a lot of wastewater to treat, so you want a plug flow design with a really long channel, something that could get you an unusually long sludge age. Only problem is you don't have the space for that. Well, might I recommend an oxidation ditch? That's where the aeration tank channel forms a complete circuit resembling a racetrack. 
The aeration usually comes from rotating brushes that contact the top of the water, both mixing up the surface and pushing the water around the track. Another modification designed for somewhat lower flows and limited space is a sequencing batch reactor. This design uses a batch process to treat wastewater rather than a continuous flow like all the other types of plants that we've covered so far. After primary treatment, the water is pumped into a cell where aerators mix it up for a predetermined amount of time. Then the aerators are turned off, allowing the activated sludge to settle. Then the clear water is decanted from the top and some amount of sludge is pumped from the bottom and the whole process starts over again. The space-saving benefits of having the aeration and clarifier be the same tank are obvious, but the design isn't as scalable as other plant types. Additionally, there's normally no way to separate out oil and grease which flow on the top of the water. Phew, that was a lot to cover. Let's cool down with some challenge questions now to test your understanding. First of all, let's say that your manager tells you you have an industrial user that's notified your activated sludge plant of a temporary short-term increase in the BOD that they're sending your way. What are some process adjustments that you could make? Increase the return activated sludge, decrease the return activated sludge, increase the aeration, or decrease the aeration. Okay. So we know that BOT stands for biochemical oxygen demand, and the aeration system exists to provide that oxygen. Therefore, it stands to reason that if you have more BOD, you would need to increase the aeration. In an actual plant, this would be accomplished by speeding up the motors on either the mechanical aerators or the blowers supplying the bubble diffusers. The return activated sludge isn't as connected to the BOD. You want to adjust the RAS to keep your mean cell retention time such that you're operating in the most efficient regime, but depending on your sludge age, that might mean adjusting it either up or down. Adjusting the RAS would not be a typical troubleshooting idea here. Next, let's say that you're building a new ASP, and you know that there will be a relatively high volume of wastewater with potential large swings in the BOD from day to day, but the space is also relatively tight. Which of these plant designs would be best suited for these conditions? Complete mix, oxidation ditch, sequencing batch reactor, or plug flow? So I would not want an oxidation ditch here because that relies on having a long sludge age, so they aren't well suited for high treatment volumes. A sequencing batch reactor wouldn't be as good for high flow rates, but it does have better marks for space efficiency and the batch nature of the process could be helpful with swings in BOD. A plug flow plant is good for high BOD loading, but not necessarily as good for low loading. The best choice here is a complete mix plant design. These can handle fl high flow volumes without needing a lot of space for aeration, and the fact that all of the wastewater is mixed together helps even out the variance in the amount of BOD loading. The trade-off would be that you probably wouldn't be as efficient as some of these other plant designs in terms of either time or energy required to treat a similar wastewater load. Last, let's say that your lab tech tells you that he noticed the number of rotifers has been increasing and he started to notice nematodes. What does this say about your operating state? You have a low F to M, you have a high F to M, you have a low MCRT, or you have a high MCRT. The presence of higher level organisms like nematodes definitely suggests an old sludge age, which is also generally associated with a higher proportion of rotifers. An old sludge age equates to a high mean cell residence time. This condition also means that your FM ratio is low since your mixed liquor is able to support developing microbes that primarily eat other microbes rather than eating BOD. An experienced operator can generally guess the sludge age by looking at the aeration basin even before checking the microbe counts. Usually the sludge in your aeration basin is a tan color, and foam maybe only covers about a quarter of the surface tops. Longer sludge age is associated with a heavy brown foam over the full surface, whereas younger sludge may have stiff, white, billowing foam. Ideally, you want to tailor your operations to stay in a sweet spot where your population of bugs strikes a balance between efficient BOD removal and good sludge settling. The conditions described in the original problem statement are at risk for excessive filamentous bacteria growth, which can lead to settling problems. Increasing waste activated sludge and decreasing return activated sludge are operational changes that could be considered to bring the plant closer to the desired operating regime. And that's all I have for you today. How did you do? Join me again next time for whoa, 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 whoa!
I think it's fun every now and then to think about how my channel might have turned out differently if I had pursued some of my other non-magic related hobbies and interests. Usually with these secret lair episodes, I have to feel a little bit bad for anyone who's new to the channel or otherwise got baited and wanted to see some more content in a similar vein. Fortunately, this time around, I have good news for everyone. Sludging for the win may have been a joke, but World of Wastewater is very real. If you ever wished that there was a channel just like Judging for the Win, except with questions about wastewater licensure exams rather than magic, go and sub to him. In fact, even if you don't care about wastewater, you should still sub. He was really awesome to work with making the script and supplying pictures for this episode. And his material from his channel was really helpful to me when I was studying for my own exam to be a licensed wastewater operator. Second, I wanted to take this opportunity to pitch wastewater treatment as a career option. I think a lot of people are like me and they'd never even realize that this was a thing unless they joined an industry where it came up. I mean, I guess intellectually I always knew that anywhere a utility was providing sewer service, they would have to have wastewater treatment plants and logically that would mean that they would need people running those plants, but I never really realized how much deeper it ran, that those plants were legally required to have licensed, skilled professionals to support those operations. Or that it wasn't just sewage treatment. Lots of industries legally require operators to oversee their pre-treatment plants. In my area, and in many others, there is a chronic shortage of wastewater operators. So, if you made it all the way to the end, you're clearly at least a little interested in it. So, check into your area's requirements for getting licensed, and the kind of careers that might lead to. But that's all I have for you today. How did you do? Huh. Am I the only one who's feeling some serious deja vu right now?